Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, April 28th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Leave it up to the bad guys to abuse yet another security feature in order to hide malware. Xavier looked at some malware that used the PowerShell PS credential class in order to store malicious code. Now, usually a PS credential is used in order to store usernames, passwords, and any other credentials being used for authentication. So this way you have sort of a nice central repository of this information that you can then use in your scripts. Uh, but in this case, the bad guy pretty much had some uh, simply off obfuscated script stored as a password essentially that could then be extracted and uh, deobfuscated and executed. Anti-malware detection rates for this kind of malware, of course, is not exactly great. For this particular sample, Virus Total showed a score of 6 out of 59 anti-malware products recognizing the file as malicious. Now, Xavier's advice here at the Management Automation PS Credential and Convert to Secure String uh, to the list of suspicious strings that you look for when you're looking for malicious PowerShell scripts. And today, Zoom finally released its famous version 5 that it promised uh, last week. So day late or so, but uh, still it was released. But Zoom isn't the only sort of collaboration and video platform that it hackers have their eyes on. Turns out there was an interesting, even though not all that terribly critical vulnerability in Microsoft Teams. The problem here was that when Microsoft Teams would access images, it would send an authentication token along with that request that would have all the information that you need to take over the account making the request. In itself, not a terribly important problem because the request was going to Microsoft's own domains, in particular to teams.microsoft.com. But CyberArk found that there are subdomains, and in particular data-dev.teams.microsoft.com, as well as aadsync-test.teams.microsoft.com. They were subject to subdomain take over and the attacker taking over these domains would be able to steal these authentication tokens from a user who opens an image sent to the user. After obtaining these authentication tokens, an attacker could then impersonate this user and use the same technique to essentially post this image, for example, to other users who within the same company, within the same organization, who would then probably be more likely uh, going to click on the particular image and also lose their tokens as part of the attack. Like I said, quite a few dependencies here and uh, really all you get is access uh, to the Teams account of the affected user. But that of course could then be leveraged to various social engineering attacks, or of course, just eavesdropping on Microsoft Teams meeting using the compromised identities, which would open the door to numerous other uh, attacks like social engineering attacks. Microsoft fixed the vulnerability, so it shouldn't really be an issue anymore. And CyberArk did publish a blog post with lots of detail about how authentication really works in Microsoft Teams. And ESET's Alan Warburton did write an interesting blog post of a botnet that they are seeing spreading in Latin America that spreads predominantly through USB drives. Now, the story was released last week. I haven't had a chance to really talk about it yet uh, due to other news, uh, but I find it quite interesting in that they actually estimate that 35,000 systems got infected with this particular botnet. Now, it's not sort of the case where uh, people got necessarily mailed uh, these uh, USB sticks or found them in a parking lot or as such. Instead, it more relied on you know, people sharing USB drives. And then, of course, it copied itself to these USB drives. What's sort of interesting is it actually sort of maintained the original file names that it found 
on the USB drive, but replaced uh, those uh, files with executables that actually turn out to be auto IT scripts that would then download and execute the actual malicious payload. So they have an example here of a drive that had like a PDF, a bitmap, a file and such. Uh, the file names are still intact. They still have the same icon, but they were all replaced with applications. So if the unsuspecting recipient gets uh, this USB drive back, they're double clicking on one of these files. Well, uh, they wouldn't expect an executable to run but that's what will happen. To make things even more tricky, the script will also open the original file. So if you're double clicking on what you think is a PDF, the auto IT script will run, install a crypto coin miner and also open the PDF that was originally located at this location with this file name. So the user really has very little uh, to sort of tell that anything went wrong. Pretty interesting little trick here and haven't really recently sort of seen a lot of uh, malware propagation uh, via USB drives. Well, uh, this is it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.